Hello YouTube. Once again, it's time to try another something something on the ML115 Generation 5. In the last video, we did some fun stuff turning it into an actual computer, and now we're actually going to see how it functions as a proper server. In this case, a file server, or basically a NAS. So we're going to use it as network attached storage. I've already put the USB stick in, we'll be installing TrueNAS Core. And here we are, booting into the installer for TrueNAS. This is the legacy version, this is TrueNAS 12, the current version is 13, which is hardware is not really meant to run. Could have tried it, but I figured we should actually go with the legacy stable version. This is 12 update 8. And it should uh, meet the minimum requirements for this version. The newer ones do require to have at least 16 gigs of RAM, and this server cannot accommodate 16 gigs of RAM, so we'll have to make do with this one. All right, we're at the selection screen for the disks. Let's pick our 120 gig SSD that I forgot I had, but that's okay. We'll use that as our boot drive. This will delete all partitions, that's fine. Installation on SATIS SAS for NVMe flash media is recommended. Yep, that's what we're using. This is a SATA one. Okay, that was weird. Uh, let's pick a password. We're going to use BIOS because this system does not have UEFI. 16 gig swap partition, yep, we have plenty of space for that. Just let it run and we'll uh, go from there. Because uh, this is going to take uh, some sweet as time. And we're through the first installation phase. There we go, detach the USB flash drive, it did not like that one bit. But that's what it wanted me to do. We're going to, well, reboot is obviously not going to work. We'll use Control Delete to do a reboot anyway. Let's go to hardest drives. We'll have to set E3128 as our boot drive. That's what the Windows 11 installation was on. We're going to nuke the other drives. Now that deafening noise is gone, we can boot into True NAS here. Should boot up pretty quickly from this SSD. Once that's done, we should be able to continue. All right, we have an IP address, and we'll go with that. We don't really need to configure anything necessarily. We can do this from the GUI as well. You we can also do it from here. Just for the sake of demonstration purposes, uh, I'll enable my numlock because that's a bit easier. We'll go and change our first interface, which is BGE0, Broadcom Gigabit Ethernet. I'm assuming it means, because it's a Broadcom card. Uh, remove the current settings, yes, because we're not doing anything just yet. Let's get to restart the network. And that didn't work at all, okay. Once again, BGE. Guess we'll just go with no. Uh, there we go. DHCP, if you want to set a static IP address, which is recommended, you choose no here. If you want to do the static reservation from within your router, you can still say yes here and just reserve the IP that it has given you. In my case, we're going to full static because I like to punish myself. We'll go with no. We want a IPv4 address, very much so. Interface name, well, we just said that as BGE0. Alright, we'll choose an IP address. 168.2. What the hell do I have spare at the moment? I think we can use... Huh. That's always tricky. I'm gonna go with 37. 
think that's pretty safe. All right, that mask is slash 24 because we're occupying the first 24 bits of our network mask with the network address. We don't want IPv6 because we don't have that configured on my network at the moment. We'll also make sure we have proper internet connectivity, so we'll also configure the DNS. Local is fine. Our first name server will be the 192.168.2.4, which is my pie hole. The second one will be my unified dream machine. We will not use a tertiary name server. And that is done. We can now go to the shell and verify that we can actually ping to the outside world. It most certainly does not, which probably means that we need to set the default gateway. We'll exit out. And let's see where we can configure that. I'm going to say default root, which is the 2.1, no IPv6 root. Okay, go to the shell again. And now we can ping to the outside world, as you can see here. We'll also do a lookup for, for instance, google.nl. And we get an IPv4 and an IPv6 address back, so we have full internet connectivity. All right, that's all we really need to do from here. We can now go straight to the web interface at 192.168.2.37, or whatever you have in your screen. And we're at the desktop here. Our login name is root, and our password is the one that we set up during setup. Pun intended. And here we have the dashboard of TrueNAS. As you can see, we have full 8 gigabytes of memory over here. Very nice, we have plenty of memory left for other activities. Our CPU is doing nothing, temperature is very low, it's sitting at 20 or 23 degrees Celsius, which is very nice indeed. Our system of information is here on the left, we can see we have a generic platform, makes sense. And it is TrueNAS 12.0.update 8.1. Alright, no VLAN set, network is not doing much. And the next thing we should do is actually set up our storage. Let's go to storage and pools. Add a pool here. Create a new pool. Here we can select our drives. I believe it is not allowed to mix drive sizes in a VDEV. So we cannot use three drives in a uh, RAID Z1, for instance. We should be able to do a RAID 0 with just these two drives here. So I guess that's what we'll do. We we'll call it RAID 0 Raptor. That's a good title, I think. Uh, let's add them to the VDEV. And create. It's going to format the drives. And here we have our set. Very nice. We can add another pool just for the heck of it, using the other 300 gigabyte drive. This will only be allowed to run a RAID 0. I actually just missed that we set it to RAID 1, I think. So I guess what we'll do is just recreate it. We can destroy everything. And destroy the entire array. Very easy to do. It did indeed create a mirror. Well, that's fine. We just we're going for a uh, balls to the wall maximum capacity setup with no redundancy. <laughs> In a production environment, please do not do this. Don't use a RAID zero unless you really don't care about the data you're storing on it and you make very frequent backups. Indeed. All right. With that out of the way, RAID zero Raptor. All right, it's now set to a mirror. We can set it to stripe over here. It's discouraged, I don't care, we're gonna force it. And confirm, and create, confirm again. Format it again, 
and we should be good to go this time around. We have 265 gigabytes free. Again, we'll add another pool using the remaining disk. Just call it that. Force. Confirm. Continue. Create. Confirm. Create. Hardly takes any effort. Just a couple of clicks. Anyway. Okay. So we have two arrays ready to go. Which is very nice. And we should be able to start creating data sets now. Let's see. Let's start with our RAID 0 here. What we can do is create a data set here. I'm going to call it files because we're going to store files on it. Always good to give it a very descriptive name. The share type we're going to use is SMB so we can share it using Windows computers, which is what's used mostly these days. Even Macs use SMB as their preferred uh, protocol these days. We can set some advanced options like quota if we want to but we don't really care about that too much right now. We'll submit it so we can create the data set here. We'll leave the other Raptor data set uh, or pool for what it is. That was just for demonstration purposes. We'll focus on this other one more in this video. All right, we can even add Z vols. This will allow you to create some volumes which you can map to other things. Very handy indeed if you're going to do some virtual machines and jails, but uh, that's outside of the scope of this video. We're mostly going to focus on file storage here. Obviously, TrueNAS offers a lot of different capabilities. If you go, for instance, to the plugins, I'm going to put that on the 300 gig actually. And plugins are some add ons, sometimes virtualized, sometimes containerized, uh, that will allow you to run some services, for instance, like Plex Media Server, Sync Thing. Nextcloud, they're very popular options. If you want to go for some community options, you can get Edgard, some backup solutions, uh, EMS uh, systems, or CMS rather, uh, MB Media Server, also a pretty decent option, Grafana for dashboarding, Guacamole for remote management of your network and other devices, Heimdall for making a dashboard for your most frequently used services. You can just make some desktop shortcuts to them basically, but in a web browser, home assistant for managing your smart home, stuff like that, media servers, Minecraft servers, OpenVPN server, Unify controller, all that fun stuff, and monitoring using Zebex, which is also a pretty decent solution. I've used that a couple times in the past, so again, just glossing over it for a little bit so you can see what kind of options we have. If you want us to uh, dive a little bit deeper into these plugins and just have some fun with installing and configuring them on TrueNAS Core using this ML115 G5, uh, leave a comment below and uh, we'll see what we can do. Any other suggestions regarding uh, stuff we can do to this server are also very welcome in the comment section below as well. Alright, back to the storage topic at hand. We have the I.O. cage here for plugins, which is out of the scope of this video. We have a data set here for files. And we can now start making shares under this uh, data set here. It will inherit, uh, if we keep everything stock, uh, in terms of settings of compression, deduplication, uh, etc. from the uh, data set we created here. So let's go to sharing and window shares. You can create a share here. It will allow us to go to a path. We can see two mounted VDEVs here. We'll go with the VDEV RAID 0 Raptor, under which we have the files data set. And we can now add a share to that. Or actually share the entire uh, thing. Um, the name files is fine, default share parameters is probably fine. We can take a look at uh, some other details here. We can use this a home share for creating home folders for our users. Uh, we can set some things for Time Machine. If you want to make uh, Time Machine backups from a Mac, you can use that setting there. This supports that natively, which is very nice. Uh, guest access is an option. We will not focus on that right now either. We'll do a nice solution with actual user accounts uh, shortly, which is submitted for now.
if it's the first time you're setting up an SMB share, it will also enable the SMB service. I've already enabled that beforehand. Now we can take a look at ACLs. We'll get back to that in a bit. First of all, we need to create a user. Usually you'll assign uh, permissions on shares and folders using groups. You can just put some users in the groups and then apply the group to the share. In this case, for demonstration purposes, we'll just use a test user. We'll call him test user, username test user. He does not have an email address because he's a bum. And let's see, password. That should be good enough. Passwords match. All right, user ID. That should be fine. We can put them into a group. Let's use one of the built-in groups for convenience sake. Let's go with, we have something fun in here, staff. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, we'll put them in a group staff. We will not give him a home folder because, again, he's a bum, so we, he doesn't need that. We don't need him to have any other rights, like sudoing. This is just a dumb user we use for a file share. All right, submit. It's now going to create a user using the user ID we specified. Okay, we can now add him to the share, and then we can map the share on our computer. Again, sharing, we know shares SMB. We have the file share over here. These are the share settings, and everything here looks fine. We'll go to the share ACL. Make sure that it says everyone full control. This is the default. It's also like this on Windows Server. If you create an SMB share in a modern version of Windows Server, and if it uh, does anything otherwise, you can just set it to full control, assuming you have Active Directory in place. We're going to File System ACL. This is what you'll be familiar with if you've used Windows Server for file sharing. This is the NTFS permissions, basically. It's a very similar setup to that. Okay, so we can take a look at our access control list. This will show us everyone and all of the groups that have certain permissions. The everyone group has basic permissions. It can traverse the folder, but it cannot read or write any data to it. The owner has full control. Any group also has full control here, basically. And it is the group, does it say anywhere? No, just group in general. And the group built-in users always have modify. All right. Let's add an ACL item for our user, and the user is called test user. It should auto fill this, but I guess we'll just have to click on it. Test user, so it's actually lowercase. Good practice in uh, Unix and Linux, use lowercase usernames and file names and folder names as well. It makes life a lot easier because, contrary to Windows, Unix and Linux are actually uh, case sensitive in every single aspect. Right, anyway, permissions basic, that's fine. We'll go with modify rights. We don't need him to change any permissions on the files. And I think that's all good to go. Apply recursively, this will allow inheritance. That's something that we want for this case because it will make things a lot easier. Child data sets, we don't have those at the moment. Let's go and save it. Okay, so now if we go back to our sharing, we now have this share set up. It's mounted to that particular folder. And for us, it only matters that we use the use uh, or the host name of our FreeNAS server or TrueNAS and add that to the back of it. All right, let's go to our computer here add a network location. I'm using Windows 11 here. I'm not sure if it actually resolved the host name using NetBus, so we're going to go with the IP address in my case, which is 192.168.2.37 and our folder is called files. It's going to ask us to log in, provide our credentials, which is test user and the password that we just made up. Click OK. It allows us to mount it. 
and I actually realized we did it ever so slowly the wrong way. It's actually nicer to do it as a drive. I like to do drive mappings. Let's give it the Q for no particular reason. It should pop up because it knows the permissions, and here we have our share. 265 gigabytes free. All right, let's see. We have the ISO for a true NAS here. Let's copy it to the share so we can see we have write permissions. We're getting full gigabit speeds here, around 100 megabytes per second. We'll put the copy in the same folder. This will use its local caching on the drive. As you can see, a rate of Raptors is actually pretty fast still, it does over 300 megabytes per second, as we can see. Alright, now we'll make a copy of all of these and put it beneath it. Takes a little more time. Now we've run out of the cache on the drives. And we get some single drive speeds. But this is a good overall performance counter. Let's go to our dashboard and see what all of the other resources are doing. You can see the ZFS cache is consuming most of our memory. CPU usage has gone up a bit. About 30% across all cores. It really showed when the cache ran out because uh, performance went down like, considerably. Right, but that's pretty cool. We've got some space in use right now. And uh, yeah, most of the data is now stored in memory cache. This is the reason why you really want 8 gigabytes of memory on this older version of TrueNAS. Uh, even if you're, if you're only running like one terabyte of storage, it really likes to fill up your RAM. So if you have more RAM, that's actually preferable. Right. So yeah, I guess that uh, shows how well... Uh, this old ML115 G5 is handling TrueNAS Core. I hope you enjoyed this video. I thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.